know? Yeah. Yes. Good. I don't like standing behind these things. Uh, they dwarf me. In any event, as you all know, my name, as most of you know, Judith DeMaio, and I am the Dean of the School of Architecture and Design. And I welcome you all here tonight, and I'm glad to see so many of you here. I know that the end of the semester is coming faster than you wish. Uh, let me remind everyone in here, including myself, I, please turn off your cell phones. Um, and remember, those of you who are registered architects, um, you can sign up, or maybe you have signed up on the form upstairs, um, so you can get your credit. Continuing, continuing education credit, and I'm not sure I ever know whether or not there's one um, form for registered architects and one for AIA members. Could somebody turn the music off in here? It's like, is this a... At least um, I'll start talking while, you, while that first slide comes up. Or actually, I can do it here. Um, oh, maybe I need to turn this on. Well, I can do it from here. Um, I see it here. We good? One second. One second? OK, well, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so I'm a, an architect and a landscape architect. And um, um, uh, I, I, as, as you said, I, I went to, to Harvard, and, and when I got out of school after five years of you know, incredibly hard work, um, I came to New York, and I couldn't get a job. And, I thought, and, and this wasn't when the economy was doing poorly, but it was you know, right, sort of right after. Um, and I guess it was 95, and I, I applied for jobs in a bunch of different firms, and they just didn't know what to do with me. They said, well, do you want to be an architect? Do you want to be a landscape architect? And I said, I want to be both. I want to do both. I want to do them together. And that was just this completely foreign concept. But I knew it was the right thing to do. And so I looked for firms that were basically doing that, but might not, be, might not really accept the fact that they were doing that. Or they were working on architecture firms that were working on landscape scale projects. And I ended up taking a job um, with uh, Buyer Blender Bell. And they, at the time, were doing um, the restoration or the redevelopment of the Erie Canal. And I thought that was absolutely fascinating. I said, that's the kind of project I want to be working on. Um, and uh, I went to the firm. And what I realized was that there was one person uh, who was doing that kind of work. And she was a planner. And she really didn't want to share it. 
um, which was too bad because you know, well, this this would have been fun, it would have been interesting, it would have been a great way to learn. But so, but what I did end up working on was a lot of um, theaters, great program, interesting building type. I learned a lot, um, and I also did the the um, pedestrian plaza in front of Rockefeller Center. Um, and we transformed it from what was just an asphalt street into a public space. So it was a really good first project right out of school. Um, and, and it has sort of shaped my thinking, I would say, about sort of the quality of, uh, or the importance of really having a very high level of detail in um, the design of public urban uh, landscapes. So, ah, okay, we have, we sort of have it, except it's the wrong scale, um, right? Um, so my talk tonight is going to be called, uh, or is called, um, Resilient Urban Environments. And it's basically about how to transform um, urban infrastructure. Um, I've developed a, uh, I'm just going to keep going. So I've developed a new paradigm of practice, I would say, that is this interdisciplinary practice. I have architects, landscape architects, scientists, sculptors, um, graphic designers. I have a lot of um, different uh, people with different skills um, working in, in my firm. And we all work very closely together and we collaborate and we communicate a lot. And I think that makes a very rich um, product. And it involves really um, thinking about ecology, community, economy, infrastructure, water, and, and climate. All right, and now I really need my slide. Oh, okay, that's different than this. Maybe we can do this. Okay, that was the first slide. Oh, second slide. Here we go, we're back on track, I think. They don't match, but that's okay. Maybe I point at this. Oh, yay, it's working. Okay, so um, so a lot of the work that I do relates to infrastructure. And part of the reason I, I think about that is that, you know, I started my firm in 2008, and I, um, you know, as a young landscape architect, architect, and I thought, you know, I'm not going to be able to compete with the Michael Van Valkenburgs of the world. I'm not going to compete with the, the big guys who are getting these big infrastructure projects or these big park projects, but there is this kind of low-hanging fruit of infrastructure that needs more design work, and it needs interdisciplinary design work, not just engineering work, because, you know, infrastructure is a term developed in the World War II era in reference to military logistical operations. It was all about just, like, getting the job done, right? But I think there's so much more to it, and so, you know what, you're going to have to press that arrow, because the this is different than this, okay? Um, so we did a competition in Montreal that I think is a little bit of a, or it sort of represents a microcosm of, of my work. Um, it was a competition to examine the infrastructure of Montreal, and because we never take on a small project, we compared that to the infrastructure of North America. Just press that button, click, and it should just play. Maybe I can do it here. No, because this is completely different than the other. If it's not going to play, I'm going to skip it. Up, oh, no, it's playing on here, but I don't want that to play on here. Up, oh, there we go. Yay, success.
So you can see that, that um, Montreal is kind of a microcosm of, of the, uh, the issues that we think about in North America. Um, but a lot of the, oops, oh no. <laughs> you know, this happened at Georgia Tech, too. There's something about like having a technology in the world. Anyway, so, or in the, so, okay. So, um, so I do a lot of my work on these global issues, um, really with, with local pilots. And I also do a lot of my work um, with grants. Um, I've actually received millions of dollars worth of, of grant funding for these local pro pilot projects that help to enable innovation that can't happen within normal, normal agency processes. And a lot of that work, a lot of that grant funding comes for the study of roads and watersheds. There are 772 cities um, in the U.S. that have combined sewer systems. Um, basically, where are we putting the thing? Okay, oh, you have it. Okay, there we go. Then I can walk. Um, so uh, basically, New York City, like these other 772 cities, has a combined sewer system. And what that means is that um, when you have uh, even a 20th of an inch of rain in the city, the sanitary sewage and the storm water combine and they pour into the harbor. And on average, in New York, uh, we have 400 million gallons of this combined effluent going into the harbor every week. So it's really a huge problem. And uh, it's a particular problem because we've paved so much of the city. So there's nowhere for that water, surface water to go. So I had this idea of trying to add to the permeability of the city by creating what I called a sponge park. And basically, wetlands act like sponges. And so I thought, why not create these spongy areas in some of these priority sewer zone areas of the city um, and, and help to absorb that water? Now, the reason that this is a priority at the moment is that the US, uh, or sorry, the, um, the uh, city of New York is under a consent decree from the EPA because of their need to comply with 1972 um, Clean Water Act um, filings. So basically, we, we now have to clean up or we have to build an incredibly expensive um, sewage treatment plant. So if you look at the, the hydrology of the Gowanus Canal, it's changed dramatically since 1766 when it was a swamp. By 2007, all of that water, or all of that water was sort of sublimated to the urbanity of the area, and there's a whole sort of technological or a whole sort of uh, mercantile infrastructure and, and industrial infrastructure that has happened on top of that. Um, and that, that water is all contained, but it kind of wants to come back. And you can see this is the, the edge of the Gowanus Canal at 2nd Street. And here, you know, it is this, this degraded edge, but this is still actually used as an active recreation area. This is the Gowanus Dredgers Boat Club, believe it or not. They have kayaks and canoes in there, and they use this as their launch point. But this is the issue, that basically we have all of this surface water runoff going over the streets, and it's, it's collecting um, lots of dirt and detritus and bringing that down to the street ends. And this is just normal storm. This isn't like a Sandy, this isn't an Irene, this isn't major water. This is just happening on a regular basis. But you can see, this is what happens. All this garbage and all this mud and oil and, and um, runoff collects here, and this is actually raw sewage that's sitting on the top of the canal. So we started to break this down um, because you know we're architects and we need to sort of break apart the issue and think about how are we going to operate here. We thought about the hydrology, the ecology, the land use, and the cultural preservation, and then you know how how does the hydrology actually sorry relate to the CSOs? How does it relate to street runoff um, and uh, the con contaminated um, water leading to poor animal habitat? Um, how do we think about privately owned spaces and start to make easements? How do we um, sort of enhance areas? Areas where we're thinking about historic preservation, how do we sort of reactivate um, some of the existing amenities, and then really how do we deal with some of these toxins, the sulfur, the cyanide, the mercury, the, the PCBs, the lead, and the oil, and the cement that's in the water. How can we start to think about the, how this open space might start to sort of deal with all of these issues or make the area cleaner and more um, 
more usable for the community. So we started by sort of mapping some of the existing conditions. Sorry, I keep using the wrong button. Um, we mapped the locations of the um, storm of the storm sewers. Um, or the storm sewer overflows. And then we also mapped locations of the, the drains um, and the outfall stations. Um, we mapped the, uh, the places where we could have uh, street level infiltration. And then we thought about having a, um, uh, a, a stormwater irrigation esplanade. How could we redirect some of the water from the upland areas um, down to the water's edge to create a new kind of open space? And we did a lot of this work in section, and I highly recommend, I mean, I don't know where you all are in your education, but I highly recommend working in section because it enables you to edit your thinking really well and, com and really work in a very complex way. Also, as a landscape architect, it's absolutely critical because what we were looking at is the permeability of this ground. What that was made of was really important in this project. And what we were trying to do here is actually stack Open, public open space over a continuous hydrologic system. Like basically there's this landscape that's kind of running underneath the, the pathway. So this is what, what that would look like. Basically you have this, this wetland um, area that can be on either side of this pathway to make a new public open space. So the, um, the Gowanus was undergoing a rezoning when we were working in the area, and there's a lot of attention to the area um, because it is valuable property, um, but it's also highly polluted. But it was, um, it was undergoing this, this rezoning, and the city planning uh, uh, department had talked about making a 40-foot esplanade. So we did these diagrams to just show what could happen in either a 20 or a 40-foot esplanade. But one of the things that we show in this diagram is that there are these conflicting sites. There are a lot of buildings that exist that, that go right up to the edge of the waterfront. Now, this isn't consistent with the idea of having a, a, a continuous esplanade. So we thought, well, it's actually important in an industrial area to have the buildings abut the waterfront. And we thought that was an important sort of historic resource as well. And we also didn't like the fact that if you have a continuous esplanade, you're only providing the benefit to the people who are right next to it. Well, or you're providing more benefit to the people right next to it than the people who are in the upland areas. So we thought, rather than having that system, why don't we take that, oops, sorry, as an advantage and actually have um, have what we called an urban esplanade, I'm sorry, an urban promenade, where the pathways actually come back up into the neighborhood. So in that way, we're creating a whole kind of green district. We're, we're enhancing the entire neighborhood rather than just privileging the edge. And so this is the Sponge Park Street uh, entrance at 3rd Street. Here, we actually created this, um, this rendering for our congresswoman whose husband had proposed to her on the edge of the Gowanus Canal. I kid you not. Um, and so this is for Nydia Velasquez. And she subsequently um, got us a $300,000 appropriation for our first um, pilot project. So we were very happy with that. Um, and here you can see an overview of the idea of this whole kind of green district. We wouldn't actually paint the, the streets um, yellow. I just thought it was easier to see that way. But it could be part of a whole green infrastructure plan for the area. So, and part of that, our plan, our original plan, um, involved the cultural redevelopment of this beautiful old um, uh, cable building. And we're now, um, we've been hired by a, a client to work on the landscape here. We actually had a floating wetland in here, and I think part of the, um, part of the planning for what to do with the, the toxins in the area is going to involve dredging out that, um, that turning basin and turning it into something like what we proposed. Um, so in the middle of doing all this work, um, the area was designated an EPA Superfund. And so that made what was a complicated project really complicated. Um, because as you can see, you know, basically there are these toxins that go out in this kind of plume. Because if you remember from that first slide, it was a swamp, right? So, so all of the oil um, and uh, other pollutants in the area are basically floating, uh, floating around underneath this landscape. Um, so it's designated a Superfund, and so the plan for the Superfund is actually to clean up the area directly underneath the canal. What I find strange is that it doesn't actually clean up the area that's not under the canal, which is related to the area under the canal because it's a continuous hydrology, but, but that's my opinion. Um, so I, this, this slide actually um, is really important. There, for any waterfront site in New York, there are 200 potential permits that you have to get for this. 
um, project in particular, the, um, the sediment underneath the canal was originally controlled by the Army Corps of Engineers, who also controls this water because it's a navigable waterway, but now that's controlled by the EPA Superfund. The shade over the water is controlled by the Department of Environmental Conservation, which is a state um, regulator. Um, the first five feet of soil in this upland area is also controlled by the Department of Environmental Conservation. The paving, the this road surface, is controlled by the Department of Transportation. The plants are controlled by the Parks Department. The water that flows over the ground is controlled by the Department of Environmental Protection, which is a city agency. So that's not to mention even city planning, who has very special, very prescriptive ideas, or not even ideas, but regulations about what can be built um, within uh, these waterfront setbacks that they've established. So it's an incredibly complicated process to try to build anything on the waterfront, much less something that is innovative. And we've done this with um, grants from the New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission, and we recently, and also the Department of Environmental Conservation, we got an environmental justice grant, and then also a grant from the state consolidated funding um, organization. Um, and, and so the first pilot is actually going to be built this, this spring, I'm happy to say. So what we're doing is actually building a, a street end sponge park um, at 2nd Street. Now the idea is that ultimately we'll be able to build a number of these street end parks and then connect them um, through, through actually that waterfront zoning that we've talked about into that more continuous hydrology. So and now we have a, another video, if, we can, if you could press that button. Um, of how it works. So right now, there are these um, uh, Parks Department green streets. <clears throat> and so, but you can see they have curbs around them. Oh, you know, press that button. Right. It's better than I am with this thing. Um, so, quick, yeah. Okay, so, so there, <laughs> works really well on my computer. Um, <laughs> So those are going to come out. Um, it's not even a big file, but click. It's not going to work there. I'm going to skip it if it doesn't go in a minute. Because basically, we're, we're transforming this whole street end. We're taking those out. We're putting in upland swales. Um, when the water comes down the street, it's going to go into this modular system at the end of the, of the street. I don't know why this isn't working. I don't know. Did you click it? This is like the most foolproof way to do it. You do embed the animation into the PDF. You don't have to go to a separate file. It should just go. It's not a big file. But, but if it's not going to work, is it going to work? Talk to me. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> All right, we're gonna skip it. It's taking too much time. Oh, but we can't. I can't. I can't advance. You have to advance too. Oh wait, here we go. I can't advance. Okay. So basically, <laughs> explain this. I, I apologize. So. Basically, the water is going to come down the street. It's coming into what, what we've designed as a modular system of um, these, these um, bioswales. What happens is the water collects in this basin. Um, this basin is a sedimentation basin, and what that does is it, it both takes out some of the detritus in that up, you know, that's coming down the road, but it also is distributing the water evenly um, to these cells. Um, and they also have notches so that the water can pass uh, between them. Um, this is designed for the 1.2 inch storm, which is a state regulated level of absorption. Um, we've also added a, a sand filter underneath this walkway to handle larger storms. Um, and then there's an outlet, um, but not actually a drain. It's sort of, a, there's an outlet that existed that's gonna go into the, the canal. So there are no more animations, so we should be home free now. <laughs> so um, there are 7,200 7, miles of bridges and elevated highways that run through US cities. Um, we're actually working on two, uh, two sites um, in, uh, in uh, uh, Flushing Meadows Park, 
sorry, in Flushing Meadows Park and in, um, in the Bronx at Pier 5 um, next to the Major Deegan. And what we've developed is, is two different systems. We have an in-ground system that takes the water off of the raised highways, and then we also have a, a more modular system. This is the prototype of the, um, the in-ground system, and what this does is it takes the water from these downspouts into a sedimentation basin and into this modular stormwater management swale. This is it in construction. Um, this is the, the basin, um, and this is it planted. Um, you know, now you can see that we haven't yet moved this pipe. We had to twist that pipe around to get it to go into the basin. And you know that meant um, coordinating with the State Department of, of Transportation, but the water that's coming out of it belongs to the DOT or DEP. Um, so it's, just, it's all this funny tangle. So this is it um, ready for duty, but this was after about a, a few sort of hundred degree days, so it's not looking really happy. Um, but so hopefully we'll get some better pictures um, next spring. This one was this was this other prototype that I thought was just going to be a disaster when I saw it in this state. But it started to come together and look better. We used, um, you know, it's all an experiment. So we, we used these gabions um, to, to filter the water. This whole area was an ash dump. Um, you know, it's, in, it's, it's referred to in, um, in F. Scott Fitzgerald's um, um, works. And it's, uh, it doesn't absorb any water. Um, and so we had to figure out some really creative ways of, of managing this water, but we came up with this gabion type as well. And here it is, again, a progress detail starting to look a little bit better. And then, um, and then the finished product. Now, when you create habitat in the city, sometimes you have um, little critters move in that you don't really want. And um, in this case, it was the muskrat, because apparently we had designed the absolute perfect muskrat habitat. <laughs> we have this, there's an outfall drain for this that also um, houses monitoring equipment, because all of these water management systems we're going to be monitoring for a couple of years to find out how much water they absorb, what's going in, uh, or how clean the water is coming in, how clean it is going out, um, really the speed with which it goes in and out of the system. But in any case, so this, this muskrat, um, really liked our outfall. And it turns out that we had designed it so that it's, it's ideal for drainage, but it's also the perfect angle for a muskrat habitat. We looked up, you know, we researched their layers afterwards and discovered that we had basically designed them the perfect layer. Um, and, but the problem is that this little guy is eating our monitoring equipment. So, um, you know, we're kind of hoping that the bobcats move in, but that hasn't happened yet. <clears throat> so we also have this other, um, other system that's kind of wacky. We worked with Paul Mankiewicz um, from the Gaia Institute um, on this system, and it's a floating wetland. So basically, the plants um, float um, in this pop-up stormwater management system that we designed with, uh, with Jersey barriers. Um, it's a self-contained system because there's no way for the water to outlet. There's no drain um, in the area. And you can see this is the problem, that we have this, what we call Lake Argenti. We're working with the Bronx Center for Environmental Quality, and um, Karen Argenti is the executive director, so we named this after her, but which she appreciated. Um, but you can see there's nowhere for this water to go, and so what we're doing is actually taking that water and channeling it into these Jersey barrier um, pop-up swales. Um, we added a waterproof liner, and we added this kind of funky tube coming off of the um, off of the, the pipe. Um, and then we also have these um, basically catwalks so that you can access the system uh, for weeding and, and getting garbage out. Because it turns out that people throw a lot of stuff out of their cars when they're in raised highways. So you end up with a lot of garbage in these sites. Um, and this is the, the wetland. Um, there's basically one wetland area and then one drought tolerant area because we didn't have the drain. So the water from this one, when it overflows, goes into the other one. So we had volunteers from the from New York Restoration Project and from the um, from BCEQ and also from um, uh, Sustainable South Bronx do the planting. Um, and his, this is um, Dart Westfall, who's from BCEQ, actually doing the planting himself. Um, and more images of the construction. I kind of like that this guy's on a cell phone. He's in the middle of <laughs> another guy taking pictures of everybody. It was actually a pretty great experience doing all of this work together with them. Um, but you can see, you know, it's a, it's a kind of nasty site. It was, um, 
it's used for the circus, but it's also a brown field, and we couldn't actually go into the ground on this. You can't have open water anywhere, so it's not like you could just have a big open pool. So the Parks Department really wanted to get rid of that big puddle, um, but, um, but you know, this, this system actually sort of, it, it's beneficial, and it didn't require really any permits because it's a, it's a pop-up and it's, it's not breaking ground. So there are 35 million US residents who live within 100 meters of a four-lane highway. Uh, when I started my practice, I applied for a grant. I know that's a common theme, but I applied for a grant from the New York State Council on the Arts. I highly recommend that you all look into that because they're great grants, um, and they're good sort of starter grants, um, and they give you, I don't know, $10,000 to do projects. And my project was to look at capping the BQE because um, I thought this was a, a problem, and it's basically in my backyard. Um, and so I started by looking at Carroll Gardens and Cobble Hill and thinking about how we might start to um, come up with solutions or come up with ideas for how to improve that environment. And that led to working on another site in Southside Williamsburg, um, working for uh, Councilwoman Reyna um, to cap the BQE in her, her neighborhood. Now, Southside Williamsburg is not sort of wealthy, fancy Williamsburg, um, and it has a median income of about $40,000 and a population of 160,000. Um, the area down in, in I'm sorry, the area down in uh, Cobble Hill was actually um, considered by city planning for redevelopment, but you know the, the median income is already very high, and we we were really thinking more altruistically um, about our work, and um, and also it's only a hundred million dollars to do the project on the northern site, and it's about a billion dollars to do the one in the south. So I just want to read this quote, and he, Robert Moses, spent a lot of time looking down at it, watching the cranes and derricks and earth-moving machines that looked like toys far below him moving about in the giant trench being cut through mile after mile of densely packed houses, a big black figure against the sunset in the late afternoon, like a giant gazing down at the giant road he was molding. It's from The Power Broker um, by Robert Caro. Um, page 846, it's a big <laughs> book, but you should all read it. It's really important because Robert Moses transformed this city and did many amazing things. But, but in some cases, you know, the intention of getting cars in and out, and this was you know, proposed as this beautiful verdant parkway, that was the bait, but the switch was that what really happened was cutting through this neighborhood. Now this wasn't the same neighborhood as it is now, it's not quite as, it wasn't quite as tony, but there were people that lived there, there were communities. It was, you know, it, it had its own character, and this highway went right through it. Um, and what this highway does is it creates a number of different physical boundary conditions, and this is true of a lot of different infrastructure typologies, um, and also creates economic disparities between different sides of the, of, of the infrastructure. So in uh, the case of the Williamsburg site, um, there are territorial boundaries where um, there's, there's actually gang violence that, that uses that as the, well, there's, there's, there's gang activity that's related to the line. So the Dominican gangs are on one side and the Puerto Rican gangs are on the other side, and, and it's, it's the sort of, it's the territorial divide. And so Councilwoman Reyna uh, really wants to erase that divide and create a different kind of space in that territory. We looked at um, public health issues and the potential correlation to the BQE, and then also use some of the metrics of Plan YC, which again, if you, if you haven't read Plan YC, you should all read Plan YC, because it's a really pretty brilliant document. But in particular, in this area, we were looking at the 10-minute walk to a park, which is a great sort of goal um, for the administration, and then also um, an idea that, that what the Williamsburg site has is a recreation desert. They have some open space, but it's not um, geared toward uh, the sort of middle school kids who are likely to get involved with the gangs. So, you know, because we're graphic designers or, and, and landscape architects and architects and urban designers, we, we think about how to sort of model and, and study um, open space. And so we use this method of sort of thinking three-dimensionally about these highways to create connectors. Um, you know, what were the different ways we could put, put those connections together? And then also thinking about how to represent kind of a, a baseline condition, um, and then also, you know, a way to measure what we were doing going forward. So in this case, 
you know, right now the car has the most weight within the wheel, but there are all these other factors that go into making a really thriving, livable city. You know, environmental benefits, development opportunities, pedestrian circulation, health and safety, and recreation. Um, so we, we put this together to sort of measure our, our progress and um, started to, well, basically, if you, if you did the, the ultimate um, plan, um, we, we ideally want to fill out all of these different, um, uh, different uh, uh, priority uh, criteria. Um, so in the near term, what we were thinking about is actually just adding uh, rows of street trees, but then in the longer term, actually doing the full capping. Um, in Williamsburg, that capping is much um, easier to accomplish, but it's not without its, its issues. Um, so we looked at the feasibility, um, we looked at the span, and that's really Im important because um, there were some places where we could actually touch down with an intermediate structure. And the reason that that was really important is that we have to bring the project up to federal highway standards um, uh, when we do this work. And so what that means is that we can't have a very thick deck because we have to have 16 feet of clearance. Granted, it doesn't have 16 feet of clearance now, but nonetheless, when you do this work, you have to bring it up to standards. So um, what we realized was that we couldn't have a very big deck, and luckily, what the community really wanted for the space in the center was active recreation space, and the Parks Department um, is really advocating for using field turf, you know, the artificial turf, um, for all of their their um, their play spaces and for their um, their sports fields, and so that was actually great because what that meant was we could have uh, field turf in the center, which doesn't require soil, right? It's not very deep profile and it's pretty light, um, and then have more of the planted areas along the, the sides in order to achieve this amenity for the community. Only $100 million, right? It's not that expensive, which w when you're thinking about an infrastructure project, it's not that bad. But, but we did need to think about the economics, and I actually want you to consider this because um, if you plant 350 trees, um, the economic benefit over 10 years is $50 million. And that's in you know pollution control and water recycling and oxygen production and, um, and, uh, and shade value. But that's not money that any one entity can take. And that's a problem. You know, it's, it's kind of, it could be a political decision to, to do this work, but it's sort of a hard political lift. But then there are other ways that you can think about the economics of a project. You can think about sort of increased economic activity of the creation of construction jobs. You can think about how, um, about the um, increased economic activity during construction, the annual gain in local retail sales. You can think about the added um, value and development potential, $16 million gain in the value of existing real estate, and an $85 million incremental land value gain um, if we actually do some, de um, some upzoning to the area. So, and then there are you know, additional benefits of improved stock of commercial and residential real estate and recreational opportunities in this underserved neighborhood. So really, it kind of pays for, for about three quarters of the cost of its improvement. But you know that wasn't enough to get the city to pay attention. So then I started playing hardball. I said, well, OK, you've got these bridges. These bridges are 50 years old. These bridges are falling down. They have a 50-year lifespan. So you need to replace them. So I said to the DOT, look, you, know, you already have to spend $10 million per bridge replacing these bridges. So why not use that to leverage you know, city expenditures against like a federal um, HUD community redevelopment grant? So now I've got kind of the wheels turning at state DOT and city DOT, and they're all kind of trying to figure out how to make this happen. But what it really takes is political will. And so we'll see what happens with the next administration, but we've got a lot of support. And when I say we, it's really, this is much more of a community-driven effort, and I've just been helping to sort of facilitate it. Um, but it does become kind of a labor of love because I want to see it happen for this community. So, and really take a space for cars and turn it into a place for people and turn this passive area, which is really just used by junkies and homeless people, um, into a more active uh, recreation space. We call this the BQ, BQE, what do we have, B, BBQE. Um, 
So, and then uh, this limited uh, recreation space, turning that into an active um, and inviting public recreation building. This is actually another $50 million to do the building, but we figure that that could happen more easily through a, a you know, private funding source. It's easier to build buildings that way rather than infrastructure. Um, so 40% um, of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast. Um, in 2010, we were part of a team with Architecture Research Office um, uh, for the MoMA Rising Currents exhibition. And what we were doing is thinking about how to prepare for climate change impacts, you know, such as we eventually got with Sandy. We didn't expect to get it in two years. We thought we were thinking 50 years out, but, but you know, things happen. Um, and what we were looking at was, um, you know, scientists projected um, a six-foot sea level rise over the next 100 years given rapid ice cap melt. And so what we were trying to do is actually think about how we might redesign uh, the city to handle that. Um, we looked at the history, the morphology of the city. You can see the water line has changed dramatically over the years. This is the 1650 water line, um, which if you look at this image, you know, it was great for ecology, you know, these nice soft edges, but not so great for getting goods from these boats onto the shore, right? So over time, we filled out the edge and we built these hardened edges to facilitate exchange at these slips. You know, there's a reason that the stock exchange is where the stock exchange is. It's where these, the, basically the goods were, were exchanged. Um, but by 1960, we developed these finger piers to um, <clears throat> enable larger ships to come into the harbor. And those, uh, those finger piers related to the street grid. But then, dun dun dun, by, by 2010, we had a very different kind of morphology. We have basically a recreation and residential edge as the highest and best use for um, the, the water's edge. And that's from a financial perspective, clearly, right? So, so it's a very different condition. Um, but, you know, the hydrology still exists. This is the Egbert Ville map of 1845. And you know, if you look at this edge, you know, this looks suspiciously like your 1640 uh, uh, water line, right? And you also have these ponds and these swamps that exist that are still there, but they've just been channelized and contained. But, but basically, what we looked at with the project was the, the value at risk, that there's a huge um, portion of the city that would be inundated by, uh, by these storms. Um, so we first um, sort of stepped back and said, okay, what are the water sources? When you had a storm like Irene, you had a lot of rain, right? So, and we have this um, problem of having combined sewers in the city, and we need to manage all that surface water runoff. But then we also have the problem of the saltwater inundation. So you've got two different water sources. We have an existing seawall, and then with a six-foot sea level rise, that's the seawall, uh, you know, breached by 2100. And this is it with a Category 2 storm inundation. It's actually 68% of Lower Manhattan. So this is um, where the CSOs are located. And our idea was to actually allow the water to come in, but then to get it out more quickly. So we developed this system of porous green streets. So basically, we have streets that can handle just sort of regular rainfall. We then, they're collector streets, the darker blue, the water from those main streets actually will filter out to those, those uh, collector streets. And then we have these perimeter streets, which function kind of the way the tunnels did um, with Sandy. You know, they fill up with water, but then, and they hold it until the tide goes out, and then, but they're doing it intentionally, um, and they're designed to hold it and not um, get destroyed. So we have this new six-foot hardened edge, um, and really, you know, we can create a barrier for the storm surge, but we can't protect or we can't create a barrier to sea level rise, right? So we need to just say, okay, we need topography. We need to raise this edge. So that was the idea behind this. So it's not just all fuzzy green stuff. 
So, but here's some fuzzy green stuff. Having said that, so um, so outbound of the uh, of that um, that hardened edge is a series of recreational open spaces and um, and wetlands, um, both salt marshes and freshwater wetlands, and then also these barrier islands, um, which exist to um, handle the the surge of and also handle start to break down the velocity of the wave. Right, because you want to break the period of that wave so that that force doesn't hit your your buildings. So we also developed what I called an urban esker. Um, you know, eskers were the glacial formation that that happened in streams in, in glacial streams when they receded, um, and it's basically like a big snake-like mound. Um, so we use that as an analogy for a, a mounded area along the east side, um, and then we built a whole new sort of development block along that that edge. But you can see, you know, Battery Park City is a little different than it was. There's a new, a new um, form um, that basically creates a balance of landscape and urbanity. So looking more specifically at that Battery Park City area, you can see here what we've done is allow the water to come in and through the city. It really creates a new kind of experience of, of urban life with that water sort of threaded into um, your day-to-day -day, uh, experience of, of of the city of city living <clears throat> so j this is um, one of the permeable streets um, basically what we've done is take all of the utilities out of the street bed and put them into waterproof vaults underneath the sidewalk again I remind you this was 2010 um, and that would protect them from the saltwater inundation and also you know Think about how many times like the, the, the um, agencies are ripping up the streets to replace the infrastructure, water main breaks or whatever. This would, would put all of those utilities into something that was um, more easily accessible. Um, so, but, and also release 28% of the, this ground um, to become more permeable, to create a more resilient city. But, you know, there are 19 million people that live in the New York City metro area, and this is that famous Yuan Bon uh, image. And, you know, the, it was kind of um, amazing that we didn't, um, we weren't more prepared for this storm um, surge of, uh, of 2012, given the, you know, I don't know, given just that that exhibit w got to so many of the agencies and you know they were thinking about it but there just wasn't it may have been that Irene um, sort of gave people a false sense of, of comfort because it didn't really hit that hard um, but in any case now we're paying attention right um, and it's created this new awareness of urban hydrology thinking about you know the relationship between these hydrologic systems and the urban systems and you know this isn't just a, a regional issue. Um, you know this. Remember um, um, Katrina in New Orleans. It's an issue for many um, coastal cities, and it's actually it's a it's really a, a global problem. This this um, map actually shows the paths of the hurricanes um, uh, globally. It's interesting that South America is actually pretty free of hurricanes, but there's still sea level rise issues. Guyana kind of goes away. Um, which is sad, um, but these um, traditional methods, engineered methods, um, can really work, um, but they only work up to a certain point, um, and they tend to solve sort of a limited set of, of problems. Um, they have limited criteria that they're working with, um, and so what we're doing is actually trying to think about how we might think about natural systems and make these sort of hybrid natural and engineered um, systems that have uh, a little bit more resiliency. And the idea is really that, you know, the natural system can be almost like the crumple zone. Um, you know, you can have something that can withstand that, that shock and, and bounce back or be pounded back out, right? Um, or rebuilt or regrow even better. Um, so we started looking, again, globally at, at different, uh, ecologies, um, reef ecologies and where they could occur. Um, we looked at, at mangrove ecologies and um, maritime ecologies. And in each case, we're trying to really think about sort of what the, the sort of economic potential of each typology is, um, you know, in terms of its carbon sequestration, its recreation potential, its, its uh, coastal protection potential. 
Um, and then looking at that in relation to global economies. So in this case, um, this is work that was beyond, um, a lot of this work was beyond the, the MoMA project, where we started um, sort of expanding our reach. And this was done for um, uh, a Metropolis article after, after Sandy. Um, but we had developed some, well, in any case. Um, so um, what, what we're looking at here, this is the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and so what we, created was a landscape, an industrial landscape that could flood. Um, and then a sort of hybrid landscape we called the bridge wetland that could have you know, planted area underneath a landscape that was sort of graded um, that you could operate machinery on. Um, and then a, what we called a, a landscape swell, so basically raising the grade to, make a, 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 to protect some of these upland buildings. So you'd still have all of this industrial space that you could use um, when it's not flooded. But when it's flooded, you have to move to the highland. Um, we created this uh, landscape for Shanghai, thinking about how to make this sort of softer buffered edge and thinking about green infrastructure strategies. Um, this is actually the Nile River Delta. And there, it's actually, I, I kind of wish that the Dutch would pay more attention to the Nile River Delta because um, a, a third of the Delta is going to be inundated with salt water. And so you have a whole region that relies on that Delta for food that's no longer going to have that resource. And it's going to cause incredible, I think, uh, political turmoil. Um, and I don't think that there are a lot of people paying attention to that issue. Or if they are, they're not talking about it. Um, so, and then, uh, and then really the, the uh, landscape of the informal settlement, figuring out how to capture rainwater and filter um, some of the brown water or the, even the, you know, the black water and the, the gray water that's coming out of these, these settlements. But it's sort of like an organized informality, which is sort of a, a funny idea. But, and then looking at, um, at more closely um, at, at Miami, this was one of our examples, um, but I'll show you in a little bit more detail because here basically you have this landscape um, that has hotels and then it has lawn and then it has a beach. And Miami is very vulnerable not only to hurricanes um, but also to the in and, uh, 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 basically the salt water coming in from the Everglades. And so um, there are a lot of, of issues, but there are also a lot of strategies that we can use, which we've outlined here. Um, and what we thought was that it was interesting to sort of look at a, at a, at a prototype um, of, of one of these blocks and think about how we might create this new kind of protective landscape. And I say it's new, but it's kind of old. Um, we're basically bringing back the, the mangrove uh, forests, but we're creating this actually genuinely new uh, bermed area that could have uh, retail space or some kind of restaurant space within it, some kind of uh, you know, program space underneath it, um, with a gate that you could shut down um, in the case of a big storm. Um, now, you're probably wondering, well, why would the hotel owners you know, allow this to happen? If you, if you are on the street and you're looking out to the ocean, you can't actually see it because it's a long way and because of the perspective. So we thought it shouldn't actually make that big a difference to the people who are staying in the hotel because if you're on an upper floor where you can actually see the ocean, you can just look over the trees, right? So um, that was thinking more sort of experientially. But what we've done here is create this pathway that comes out to the beach and then also accentuate the, um, the breakwater areas and create these, these swells, try to create you know, interference for the wave action. But you know, I guess the, the other thought I had on all of this is that you know, sometimes it doesn't necessarily make sense to stay and build up. Um, and maybe we should think about retreating. And so again, you know, I, I tend to think um, holistically and I start thinking about what makes projects happen and it tends to relate to money. Um, and so I was looking at property values in New York and you know, recognizing that the real estate in Manhattan and parts of Brooklyn and you know, parts, of, parts of the city are actually very valuable. Um, and a lot of those, that real estate is actually on high ground. So maybe what we should think about is doing like a what I called zone air, um, basically a transfer of air rights to some of the more valuable areas in order to pay for 
um, the either the relocation of people away from these coastal zones or and or um, the the development of more resilience systems in those zones now I know the people live there and they have you know emotional ties to a lot of these places but at the same time it's like if you if your mother is gonna get washed away like you have they have to start we have to start thinking about the consequences of staying in some of these places where we're really just too vulnerable to stay so you know it's more than the money it's just it's about human life but but um, so the idea here is just to to um, think about this transfer of these of this um, zoning rights and really ideally what we want to do is take the value you know from these upland areas and transfer that into this new kind of, uh, I'd like to call it a, um, an urban resilience fund to create a more resilient city. And with that, I will end and ask questions. Thank you. And I'm really sorry about the animation issues. So, well, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes anyway, it doesn't. Thank but you. That was really, really an interesting talk for our students and for us. Are there questions? Hey, don't be shy. I know you're tired. It's the end of the don't semester. Don't be but shy. Did, did we, can, can we get somebody to, yes. Oh. Um, so could you talk more about the. Can you stand up? So the There's a mic. Great, okay, hi, so thanks for being here. Um, could you talk a bit more about the different types of plants and as salt water comes in, how it affects plants that are not salt water friendly okay. and maybe how you try to transition between well, the two? You know, it's a really good question because um, after Sandy, I actually went down to the Gowanus Canal and I, I looked to see what was happy and what wasn't happy. Um, some plants are designed to actually withstand um, the inundation of salt water. They either have waxy leaves or they have um, like the, the, you know, the fuzzy green leaves. Um, and um, what that does is it actually gives, it, it gives the plant a, a barrier to that, the absorption of the salt so they can withstand it. So there are plants like Rosa rugosa and um, uh, actually clover is really great. Um, uh, uh, Mirica, uh, bayberry, a lot of the marsh grasses, um, and um, things like, uh, actually even like echinacea is, is great, uh, and some of the willows, and um, black-eyed Susan's rubecchia, uh, and sassafras trees are really great. So, but, but along with the salt tolerance, we actually also um, do a lot of work with uh, phytoremediation. Um, so um, we're trying to specify plants in these bioswales that can actually break down some of the biological toxins in the, in the stormwater, but then in, in some cases actually absorb it. And so the, the research is, is fairly young in this area, even though when I was in grad school, people were looking at it, but um, that was a long time ago, 20 years ago. But, um, but it's still, there isn't a lot of sort of conclusive data about um, the, the benefits of it, but I think that that's coming out. Um, and so we, uh, we think it's fruitful and worth exploring, and so we're, we're gonna try it. Um, now, part of the reason for doing the monitoring that we're doing is so that we can find out what, what the plants are doing. Um, you know how they are actually trapping those toxins, but they're also um, I don't uh, I don't want to neglect um, the importance of soil um, because we have very highly engineered soils in these um, systems, and um, you know that was probably the hardest thing to specify. Um, but there's microorganisms in the soil. There are microorganisms in the soil um, that actually will also be doing some of that work um, to clean the water, um, and so. You know, we'll also be needing to sample that both, you know, before and after. So it's a good question. Have you had a question? Um, I, I know that uh, a lot of your work deals with uh, public projects that no, no one person comes up to you and says, this is my idea. And um, the, the work is clearly evident that it leads on to other projects. And I know that you're involved in the design for public space but the underutilized uh, 
spaces, and I wanted to know how how do you how do you uh, how do you as a practice proceed to like get those kind of projects and work well, on them? Well, in some cases, I just look for sort of problems um, in the city, and because I've been applying for grants for a long time, I have sort of a you know I, I kind of know what's out there, and also you know I wasn't initially successful in my grant application. So that's something I want you all to know also, that you know, basically come up with a good idea and try to you know, package that idea as clearly as possible. And then you know, sometimes you apply for a grant and it's not the right granting organization. And so it's not that your proposal is bad, um, it's just that you're not asking the right organization for the money. So I've had issues with that. So I, I just, I don't know, I just think about stuff that could be improved and and try to come up with proposals i have the i mean the the one with the design trust that was actually an idea that um i i didn't come up with it was um it was a fellowship that was out there and there was an application and i thought you know what i do a lot of work with raised infrastructure i should really be thinking about this and i'm so happy i did because there's 666 miles of raised um structures in the city and we're developing six different prototypes for how to create systems that when implemented on a broad scale could really have a, a big impact. But you know, it's a different level of thinking. It's, it's I mean, it, I, the thing is I really care about form and I care about beauty, um, but at the same time, it's like, you know, you have to think about sort of the standardization and the maintenance and the, you know, how how you create something that that can happen, say you know, 600 times. Like, how how do you sort of reconcile the the desire for specificity with the desire for making that bigger impact? So it's it's pretty interesting as a sort of design issue to explore. Um, so that's the design trust. Um, I don't know. I have another. I I mean, I I got a grant from the AIA. Um, a Bruner grant to look at creating a, a resilient, or basically a, 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 a model of stormwater um, in the city, and and it really came from from need. You know, I think that you know we have these the ability to create these three dimensional models, both you know in lots of different programs, um, but um, and in in GIS that that can have attributes, right? That you can describe characteristics to to the the section um, and so but I thought there isn't really a way to combine that with a parametric modeling system to have a more dynamic sort of view of what's happening in the urban landscape so I applied for a grant to do that now you know I am not an expert in these things but I had the idea of the need of how to of for combining these different softwares to actually create a, a tool that would be really valuable for um, um, for basically decision makers um, in the city. So, you know, I just put it all together and then what I sometimes do is start with a small one, um, a pilot, and then build that to make a, a, a bigger project. Some other questions? Yes. That was a long answer. Um, so my question is, uh, a lot of this work um, seems to have a lot of very uh, detailed research um, involved. Uh, I guess my question is, how much would you say um, is, is research that um, is coming from statistics from other organizations, and how much of this information is uh, your organization uh, doing its own research and kind of finding out this information that isn't quantified yet um, and turning these proposals into a very realistic vision? Well, you know, as designers, we're, we're not necessarily experts in all of these different fields. So we're really using data that's coming from um, sort of bona fide scientists, right? So, or even um, agencies. So like the, the metrics on the, the value of trees, that came from a really sort of huge, boring report. And it was like that thick, um, <laughs> right? It was all words. Um, about the value of trees. And so we thought, well, okay, 
that's one way to interpret it, but we could turn it into a one-page diagram and it's gonna have a lot more impact. So we read, we interpret, and we draw, right? So that's, but it's taking the data that exists from people who are like true experts and using that, but always referencing the sources. That's absolutely critical. Um, so, I mean, it's, when you're doing a lecture, it's like, you know, hard to reference the sources, but if I were publishing any of this, you know, the research would be attributed to various, um, you know, wherever it, where it's coming from. But, yeah, so it's a good question. Uh, thank you. Um, my question is, um, most of your projects that you've presented to us um, deal with the city edge, uh, mostly uh, waterfront projects and highways. Uh, I was wondering if there are any um, infrastructure projects in the core of the city that you think could benefit from this type of thinking as well, um, in terms of ecology and, and giving back to, new, to the environment, well, like I subway systems and railways. Well, actually, in terms of subways and railways, yes, that, um, we're working on some of those structures with the Design Trust Fellowship, um, and it's still in its its sort of teenage stage, so it's not ready to show. Um, but um, we're also we've also done a couple of projects. Um, actually, there's another project that we've just started um, for the the Queensway. Uh, we won Queensway um, back in June. Um, and we started working on it about a, a month ago. Um, and uh, I have to say, I'm a little bit sort of shell-shocked from a community meeting last night that was really intense um, because there's a lot of opinions um, about what should happen there. Um, but, but that's a really interesting um, project because it's a, it, it used to be a rail corridor um, and it, it basically goes like north-south through Queens. And if you've ever sort of looked at, well, I'm sure you've all looked at, the transportation systems in New York City, they all go to Manhattan, right? They're all like, you know, they all go oops, east-west, um, and there aren't a lot that go north-south. And, you know, if you experience the G train on a regular basis, you understand how problematic that is because um, my whole world or a lot of my world is in Brooklyn and you know or Brook I go Brooklyn to Queens because I go out to the DEP right or I go out to the Parks Department so it's impossible so so anyway so the um, this Queensway is interesting because it is this north south conduit um, but it goes from an embankment to an area where it's actually cutting through the terminal moraine of the glacier um, to an area where it's actually very much like the High Line except that there are businesses that are underneath it and there are places where you know there are auto shops and places where you can actually make a mess it's an industrial landscape um, so there are many 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 ecological issues that we're going to be dealing with on that project and that one is much more of a kind of it, it can be more of a classic kind of park um, but there are going to be some areas where we're trying to balance uh, you know economic development and um, and you know park creation you know do does the neighborhood actually need to have more open space um, you know in some areas we're just we're trying to reconcile all of that and and figure it out now but again we're we're in very much of the infancy of that project um, on a smaller scale we did a plaza down or we designed a plaza it hasn't um, gone forward yet but um, down at Edgar Plaza which is between the World Trade Center and the Statue of Liberty and there what we did was actually um, take what was a median space and regrade so that the water actually flows into a, a, a planting area um, that aligns with the 1625 water line. So it's kind of neat because it's you know references that historical line, but it's also related to you know climate change impacts because you know the water would come up there if we had a big storm surge again. But we designed um, these um, uh, structures that are. Uh, basically shade shade structures that also have solar panels that are integrated so when you're out and you, you know you see your your iPhone is on zero you can go and sit down and plug in your phone get an ice cream hang out you know and, and or you could like take your laptop out and work outside um, so it's you know it's it's basically adding urban amenity and or combining urban amenity with sort of ecological function and that's that's a big goal of the practice it's that kind of do as much as you can because the space in 
the city is just too valuable not to have it do as many things as it can possibly do.